continent has ties in every corner of the world. In this and future programs, we aim to bring major artists and thinkers together to kind of flesh out the challenge of image making in and about Africa. Tonight, Alfredo Yar will give an artist talk. This will be followed by a conversation between Yar and Dr. Mantia Diawara. We will then take questions from the audience, and you can see we have microphones strategically placed. Alfredo Yar was born in Santiago, Chile, and is an artist, architect, and filmmaker. Yar has participated in the Biennales of Venice, Sao Paulo, Sydney, Istanbul, Kwanju, Johannesburg, and Seville. He has received the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Award, a Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award, fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Yar is featured on the PBS series Art 21 that showcases leading contemporary artists. His work is represented in major collections around the world, including Gold in the Morning in the collection of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Uh, his selected exhibitions include The Sound of Silence from 2009 at the Gallery La Longue in New York, Continental Rifts at the Fowler Museum of UCLA in Los Angeles, that was then, this is now, at PS1 Contemporary Art Center in Long Island City, New York, New Perspectives in Latin American Art, 1930 to 2006, Prints, Photographs, and Media Works at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Before starting, I really want to thank the Latino Center at the Smithsonian, who generously has supported this through um, the Latino Initiatives Pool. Also, the kind of hearty support of Eduardo Diaz, the director of the Latino Center, and also of Dr. Janetta Bech Cole, the director of the National Museum of African Art. I'd also rec like to recognize the help um, of the staff and this wonderful um, auditorium here at the National Museum of American Indian. And a special thank you to Damien uh, Gessner for his webcasting and AV um, talents extraordinaire. So please, um, we're so pleased Alfredo Yar is here. Do join me in welcoming him. Good evening, thank you for coming. I'm honored by your presence. I wanna thank uh, Jessica Martinez for inviting me and the Smithsonian Institution and also this extraordinary museum to welcome us here. I also wanna thank uh, Mantia Diawara, someone that I admire very much and I'm honored that he will share with me the stage later. My intimate wish was that he would be speaking tonight and I would be seated there in the dark watching him, but at least we're gonna have a conversation later. So, uh, for the last 20 years, I divided my work as an artist in three main areas. Only a, a third of my time is spent within what we call the art world, meaning museums and galleries and foundations. Because the art world is so small, so insular, I felt the need to get out of what we call the white cube and do works that I call public interventions, meaning works that take place far away, removed from the art world, in communities and places that have really nothing to do with the art world. There I confront myself to real world problems with audiences that are not expecting art. And then the final third part of my practice is teaching. I direct workshops and seminars around the world, and there I exchange my, my knowledge, my experience with the younger generation from whom I, I learn enormously. And uh, this exchange enriches me intellectually tremendously. I feel complete as an artist only by doing these three things at the same time, and I cannot imagine my life any other way. Tonight, uh, I've decided to concentrate on the Rwanda project, a project to which I dedicated six years from 1994 to the year 2000. It's the longest project of my career, and uh, I created 25 different works. 
I had to revisit these works recently because I've started to design a memorial for the victims of the Rwandan genocide in Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. So that took me back to Rwanda after all these years. And at the end of my presentation, I would like to share with you my most recent project, which just opened in Santiago, Chile, which is a memorial also for the victims of the Pinochet regime. So my presentation will last approximately one hour. I would prefer not to be interrupted, but I would be happy to discuss with you after my conversation with Mandia. Let's have the lights, please. April 6, 1994, a plane carrying the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi is shot down above Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. Their death sparked widespread massacres targeting Hutu moderates and the minority Tutsi population in Kigali and throughout Rwanda. The Rwandan Patriotic Front, which had been encamped along the northern border of Rwanda, start a new offensive. April 12, 1994. The interim Rwandan government flees Kigali for the town of Hitarama. Relief officials estimate that as many as 25,000 people have been killed in Kigali alone in the first five days of violence. April 21st, 1994. The United Nations Security Council Resolution 912 reduces the UN peacekeeping force in Rwanda from 2,500 to 270. 50,000 deaths. April 30, 1994. At least 1.3 million Rwandans have fled their homes. More than 250,000 refugees crossed the border into Tanzania, the largest mass exodus ever witnessed by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. 100,000 deaths. May 8, 1994. The Rwandan Patriotic Front gains control of most of northern Rwanda. As killings continue, hundreds of thousands of refugees flee to Zaire, Burundi, and Uganda. 200,000 deaths. May 13, 1994. More than 30,000 bodies washed down the Kagera River, which marked Rwanda's border with Tanzania. May 17, 1994. The United Nations Security Council passes Resolution 918, authorizing the deployment of 5,500 UN troops to Rwanda. The resolution says, Acts of genocide may have been committed. May 22, 1994. The Rwandan Patriotic Front gains full control of Kigali and the airport. 300,000 deaths. May 26, 1994. 
deployment of the mainly African UN forces delayed due to a dispute over who will provide equipment and cover the cost for the operation. 400,000 deaths. June 5, 1994. The United States argues with the UN over the cost of providing heavy armored vehicles for the peacekeeping force. 500,000 deaths. June 10, 1994. The killing of Tutsis and moderate Hutus continues, even in refugee camps. 600,000 deaths. June 17, 1994. France announces its plan to send 2,500 troops to Rwanda as an interim peacekeeping force until the UN troops arrive. 700,000 deaths. June 22, 1994. With still no sign of UN deployment, the United Nations Security Council authorizes the deployment of 2,500 French troops in southwest Rwanda. 800,000 deaths. June 28, 1994. The UN Rights Commission's Special Envoy releases a report stating that the massacres were pre-planned and formed part of a systematic campaign of genocide. July 4, 1994. French troops establish a so-called safe zone in the southwest of Rwanda. July 8, 1994. As the Rwandan Patriotic Front advances westward, the influx of displaced persons into the so-called safe zone increases from 500,000 to 1 million within a few days. 900,000 deaths! July 12, 1994. An estimated 1.4 million Rwandans flee towards Zaire. More than 15,000 refugees cross the border every hour and enter the town of Goma, which becomes the largest refugee camp in the world. A cholera epidemic sweeps through the camps in and around Goma, killing an estimated 50,000 people more. July 21st, 1994. The United Nations Security Council reaches a final agreement to send an international force to Rwanda. One million people have been killed. Two million have fled the country. Another two million are displaced within Rwanda. August 1st, 1994. Newsweek magazine dedicates its first cover to Rwanda. I did this performance in December of 1994 in Chicago. The structure of the performance is very simple. 
The idea is to read the events week after week in Rwanda. And the criminal indifference of Newsweek magazine and of the world community. Newsweek, unfortunately, was not alone. This is uh, May 13, 1994, the New York Times. This is page A5. This is how this uh, article ends. In the meantime, thousands of bodies are washing down the Kagera River, which marks the border with Tanzania. The Lutheran World Federation in Geneva said it had begun clearing the bodies out of the river near where it empties into Lake Victoria in Uganda. It said the operation was requested by Uganda and financed by $100,000 provided by the United States. It said the operation did not include collection of an estimated 50,000 bodies that already had washed into the lake. At this point, at this date, we have approximately 350,000 people dead in three weeks. So this is one of the first works I created uh, after the performance. It's called simply A5. And it's the, uh, the New York Times clipping and an enlargement of the last paragraph of that article, A5. This is the New York Times Magazine in July. This is around 900,000 people dead. 100,000 more were about to die in the next week. And they have this essay, photographic essay by Sebastián Salgado on the refugees, not on the killing. This is uh, The Economist at the end of July, almost at the end of the genocide, with a cover that asks, who will save Rwanda? selection of uh, magazines around the world. This is a French magazine, also by the end of July. Rwanda, the horror of the world. We can also joke about it. At the right, this little corpse is offered three choices, a machete, a Kalashnikov or cholera. This is the end of July. Rwanda, fear or cholera. The extraordinary news we cover after the genocide ended. As you realize, they managed to put four times O.J. Simpson on the cover in between. And here it is still there, O.J. and race. A Newsweek poll. A race with death. That race ended at the end of July. Can they be saved, they ask. No, they are dead. Helping out, they suggest. They give a list of people. In 
you know that time in Newsweek, they spy to each other. And so they know what their cover will look like. So when Time knew that Newsweek was coming out with um, Rwanda, they had to go with Rwanda too. So this is Time on August 1st, 1994. This is the beginning of the final days. This is the apocalypse. This is a quote from a resident of Goma, where this largest refugee camp in the world was built. And then, of course, the question had to be asked by certain uh, media. So here we have this French magazine that says, taboo question, should we recolonize Africa? And of course, the drama of independence. I'm going to stop with the media uh, representation and uh, move on to a few uh, works. This is a series of postcards that I sent from Rwanda via Uganda because there was no communication possible in Rwanda. I had found a destroyed post, post office in Kigali and found some postcards on the floor. So I took them and started writing on them the names of people I was meeting, survivors, and sent them to friends. Jean de Dieu Ngulimana is still alive. Joseline Mukajiranga is still alive. Justine Umararungu is still alive. Rubanda Dresifoli is still alive. I wanted to send signs of life. This work makes a very direct reference to a, a very well-known work of conceptual art by an artist called Unkawara. In this work, he sent postcards to friends in the 60s, and the postcard would say, I am still alive. I am still alive. I've always liked that work. Here, I, I make a reference to that work, but I take out the self-referential aspect of that piece and decide to talk about someone else. Caritas Namazuru is still alive. A few months later, I was invited by the city of Malmo in Sweden to create a public project. They offered me 50 light boxes around the city that I could use. I wasn't ready to show any of the 3,000 images I had taken in Rwanda. So I did this work only with text it simply said, Rwanda, Rwanda, Rwanda. I picked a very basic font, Futura Bold, and I repeated eight times as large as I could in the width of the poster. There were no name, no phone number. It was a kind of cry. As the light boxes had been donated to this uh, nonprofit organization, some of them were isolated in very uncommercial areas with little food traffic. For example, this one. But I liked it. I felt the silence, the invisibility of these light boxes 
parallel the invisibility of the Rwandan people. The first major project in a museum was called Real Pictures. And it consists of 550 photographs that I installed inside black archival boxes. These boxes are used to archive photographs. Each box contains an image. And on top of the image, we have printed a text that describe the image inside. And with these boxes, using them as modules, as bricks, I've created these memorials, stones, columns, walls of different shapes that are minimally lit in the dark. Here, I'm inviting people to come into the dark space and to read about the situation and not to see. This is a kind of reverse strategy. I thought, well, no one saw these images because no one reacted. So perhaps that, now that I hide them, maybe you will see them better. So there were dark spaces, spaces of silence, with a lot of empty spaces, because the silence and the darkness speak. Even though people could not reach the boxes underneath the first layer, every box contained an image. For me, it was very important. Natarama Church, Niamata, Rwanda, 40 kilometers south of Kigali, Monday, August 29, 1994. This photograph shows Benjamin Musisi, 50, crouched low in the doorway of the church among scattered bodies spilling out into the daylight. 400 Tutsi men, women, and children who had come here seeking refuge were slaughtered during Sunday Mass. Benjamin looks directly into the camera as if recording what the camera saw. He asked to be photographed amongst the dead. He wanted to prove to his friend in Kampala, Uganda, that the atrocities were real and that he had seen the aftermath. When we showed real pictures, we had uh, a resource room where we offered the audience a table with press clippings and information about some NGOs working in Rwanda. And we also showed them what the media had done with this subject. And we also offered them a space where people could write down their emotions, their ideas, their reactions. Real pictures. This was already the fifth work and I couldn't stop because all the works were failing and failing and failing. Most people couldn't care less about this information. So how do you make art out of information that most people would rather ignore? So each work became an essay on representation, an exercise, a futile exercise. This is a different one. This is one is called Field, Road, and Cloud. Here I present three large photographs on the wall with three black and white labels that contain a little drawing. 
So when you first see this, you only see the landscape and, and you cannot see very close. You have to get close in order to see the, the black and white ones. So when you get close, you realize that the first one is just a field, an empty field, a field of tea. And then when you look at the drawing up to the right, you realize that it's on August 29, 1994. It's the shot number 15, and you're on the main road, 40 kilometers from Kigali, and we're looking at tea fields. And apparently, we are going towards the Nadarama church here on the top right. So then the spectator understand that these are sketches that the artist or photographer does to remember what is the image about. The second is a, a road, a luminous road, with a beautiful light going through the trees, a little of sky. And then the image next to it says, shot number 21, road to Natarama Church on the same date. Then we understand, ah, that's where he's going. The last image is simply a beautiful sky with a single cloud. So we look at the drawing on the right, and it says, shot number 28, lonely cloud, August 29, 1994, Natarama Church, Niamata, 40 kilometers south of Kigali. And then we notice on the left, bodies, 500, only then we realize that the photographer is surrounded by corpses and is photographing this cloud above him. Field, road, and cloud. Here I wanted to, to evoke, instead of showing this pornography of violence, showing these bodies that no one wanted to see and no one saw when they were shown. And also because when I went back to New York, I realized I had taken many more images of landscapes, of flowers, that I realized at the time. And I discovered that I, I did this very methodically, once in a while, almost looking for a breathing space. I think one day I may do a show of Rwandan flowers taking during the genocide. This is a, one of the uh, major works of the Rwandan project. This is a big space where you enter in the dark and you're facing a long corridor that leads you to a second space. Everything is painted black, and the first wall has a line of text that is illuminated from inside. It measures around 15 feet. But it's a very tiny font. It's approximately half an inch. So you have to get close and start reading slowly. Walk along the text in order to reach the next room. And the text tells the story of what happened in Rwanda in the face of the criminal indifference of the world community. And then roughly midway through the text, he tells the story of a woman named Gutete Emerita, who was attending mass with her family when the massacre began. And she witnessed how her husband Tito Kaina Umuna and her two sons, Muhosa, eight, and Matirigari, ten, were killed in front of her eyes with machetes. Somehow, she managed to escape with her daughter, Marie Louise Ana Malarunga, and they hid in a swamp for three weeks, coming out at night only in search of food. So that's what the text. Uh, tells us about. And uh, 
This is how the text ends. When she speaks about her lost family, she gestures to corpses on the ground, rotting in the African sun. I remember her eyes, the eyes of Gutete Emerita. So here we have reached the end of this 15 feet long line of light and text. And then we move on to the next space. And we are confronted with a huge light table, a table illuminated. This is tables that photographers use to look at their images through the light. This measures 18 feet by 12 feet. On top of which we find a million slides. As we approach the table, we realize that there are loops, magnifiers, all around, inviting us to take a slide, to take many slides and, and look at them through the magnifier, like a photographer does. So this is the moment I have designed when someone's eyes are one inch away from the image. The eyes of Gutete Emerita. And as we start picking more slides, we realize it's the same slide repeated a million times. Here, I'm trying to create a balance between information and spectacle. In my view, the only way this image will resist and will not be dismissed is if we understand the meaning of the image. And so that is the purpose of that text at the entrance of the space. Only because we understand the story, then those eyes become meaningful. And of course, in the story, we cannot talk about a million dead because it's meaningless. What does a million mean? It's an abstract number. So I had to reduce the magnitude of the event to a single person to a single story with a name, names of her daughter, her son, her husband, exactly what happened and how it happened. This delicate balance between information and the visuals and the spectacle. I've shown this work uh, a dozen times around the world. And the first time we showed it, during the opening ceremony, the uh, museum guard called me and asked me to come to his booth where he had different cameras looking at the spaces. And he asked me to sit and look at a particular camera, I mean video monitor that was looking at this space. He had noticed that people, after a while, after experiencing the work, was taking a slide and putting it in their pockets. And so he gave instruction to the guards inside the museum and inside my space. And he was asking me, what should we do? I sat there mesmerized, and I tried to understand the, the body language of the people taking these slides. And to me, it never read as if they were stealing. It read differently. And so, on the spot, I decided to let it happen. I said, don't stop it, but don't encourage it, don't say it, <laughs> but if you see this happening, look the other way, ignore it. And so, 
Today, we have 150,000 slides in people's homes. And I work out a system with the insurance company that every time I show this work, they give me the slides that are lost. The eyes of Gutete Emerita. Around the project 1718, I, I started getting desperate. I wanted to get out and, and, and get funds to send to Rwanda to help. So Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, was celebrating a cultural capital of Europe and they invited me to do a project for the city. So this was an opportunity and I created this public project called The Gift. And we printed uh, 10,000 red boxes and gave them away to people with volunteers. We would simply approach people in the street and ask, may I offer you a gift? There was a lot of press and TV about this project, so after the third day, people was already looking for these boxes. And so here, a volunteer is, is opening a, a box to start giving them, and, and she has to, to hurry because people is just waiting for these boxes. This is how it works. The box is entirely red, and there's a single sign on one corner that says, please open here. What did you expect? We only ask you to, for once, get out of yourself and think for a second in someone else. Please help us, Doctors Without Borders. And then, in the small type, we invite people to open up the box completely and refold it in reverse, leaving the outside inside and the, outside, the inside outside. And so this is how it is inside and this is how it becomes when you fold it back the other way. And on the four sides, you have image of two kids that are watching this horrible scene. But we never see the scene. We only watch them, and we look at their body language, looking at the scene. That's the number one. Two. Three. Four. So in this very simple scene, you see these two kids expressing solidarity, love, pain, all the things that the international community never expressed. So that's why I selected these four images on the sides. And on the top, we had information about Doctors Without Borders. It's a non-government organization that I deeply admire. And uh, we had a pre-cut card there that can get out very easily. And this is their bank account number inviting people to send money or when they are in the bank to deposit money on their account. And so the box becomes a money box and a conversation piece in, in homes. And once it's filled with money, after a while they would go to the bank and, and make a deposit. So we raised around $200,000 in a month. The gift in Stockholm. One of the last projects I did about the genocide was in France. Because if there are three main countries outside of uh, Rwanda connected to the genocide are Belgium, the United States, and France. And uh, both Belgium and the United States have recognized 
reluctantly, but in a way recognize their, their lack of involvement and what they could have done and so on. But the French have not. And they're probably the most closely responsible for arming the Hutus. So I wanted to do a public project here. And so this is the, the Palais. Uh, this is the mayor's office, Hotel de Ville in Lyon. And for three days and nights, we projected the names of places where the genocide occurred on top of the facade. Names that nobody knows what they mean or care about. Kigali, Jikongoro, Rukara, Shiangugu, Mibiritsi. So in those three days, a million people came and the mayor of Lyon had the very good idea of having a, a VIP party the same night. So while they were having a party, we were projecting these words on the facade. You can see the crowds at the bottom. The piece is called Signs of Light. How could this happen? We live in a racist environment. The entire world follows the same pattern of racism. And the media, instead of resisting it and teaching it, us to resist, just extends it and makes it worse. I've done a lot of works about media representation of Africa. And uh, I just wanted to show a couple to explain the context in which we act and the context in which we live. This is a, a piece called Searching for Africa in Life. What we have here are the thousands and thousands of covers, all of them, of Life magazine from 1937 when it was created until when the magazine ended. And if you search for Africa in Life magazine, you will find five or six covers. And they are mostly covers of animals. This is the magazine that taught our parents many generations how to look at the world. This magazine grew with photography, with photo reportage. This is how we learn of the world outside of our countries. Searching for Africa in life. A recent work I completed, I think in um, 96, I've been collecting time covers on Africa. These are the nine covers on Africa in the last 25 years. This piece is called From Time to Time. And I divide them in three categories animals, hunger, and disease. There is no architecture in Africa. There is no music. There are no cities. There is no culture. There is no science. There is no sports. From time to time. An even more recent one Business Week magazine asks, can greed save Africa?
this is the environment where we live. And this is in the entire world like this. So that's why we uh, dehumanize them. I went back to Kigali many, many years after my project, which ended in 2000, because I was invited to, to create a memorial for the victims of the genocide. And I was able to visit all the memorials created around the country to remember the victims. I wanted to see what had been done in order to do mine. So I attended a, a large conference on the genocide with intellectuals and writers. And I visited most memorials. And they all work with the same iconography that we all know, but also with different iconographies that we are not familiar with. This one we know, it's when we just display the faces of our loved ones. In, in a particular memorial in Kigali, there was a lot of emphasis on children because the death squads killed hundreds of thousands of children. They said, we don't want to make the mistake we did in the 90s when we left the children alive. This time we will kill them because they would not grow to become Tutsis. And then they have this place of clothing as if there was a belief that the clothing still held the soul of the people that inhabited them. And so they display them in these very elaborate vitrines and tableaux. And then vitrines with skulls, many skulls, many, many, many skulls. Many, many, many skulls and bones and more bones. And then they have graves, mass graves in concrete in different areas. Where you can actually access them and visit inside them. And of course, walls with names, thousands and thousands of names. They have also preserved some of the places where the killings took place. This is one of the churches where the death squad destroyed some windows some people had found refuge in the church. They thought that the, the killers would never come into the church, but they went in and they killed everyone. And inside, we find the clothing. Why this display? For Rwandans, it's a matter of trying to convince the world that this happened, but they can't still accept the fact that no one intervened, that no one wanted to help them and stop it, as if they didn't believe them. So they want to show you, you see, it really happened. You should have come. That is the rationale behind the memorials.
on one of my return visits working on this memorial design, I created a, a very short three-minute video that I would like to share with you. But uh, life must go on, and so things are returning to normal, and people get married, and there is beauty, and uh, new lives start every day. I, I want to finish with uh, my most recent work that took place in Santiago de Chile. This is a way to, uh, to help uh, the tension calm down about Rwanda. Try to distract you for five minutes, even though the, the subject is as depressing as the first one. Uh, this is a memorial uh, for the victims of the Pinochet regime. And uh, Michelle Bachelet, the president of Chile, that just uh, ended her term in March. As part of her legacy, she created this new museum of memory and human rights. It's the green building that you can see there on the right. It was the result of an international competition that was won by architects from Brazil and I was offered uh, to create the memorial in the square in front of the building. It's 
So when I was offered the space, I realized that I could never compete with this huge building made of copper that was going up. So I decided to create a memorial where you have to go down. And so my work is there. It's a hole in the ground and inviting people to walk six meters down. The entrance to my memorial is 20 meters away from the entrance to the museum, which is there on the right. The piece is titled The Geometry of Conscience. So you go down the stairs, 33 steps, and you reach a five meters by five meters space, which is underground, and inviting you to enter a second space. The second space is also five meters by five meters by five meters. It's totally empty, it's only concrete, and there is a guard inviting you welcoming you and saying, welcome to the geometry of conscience. And then he will ask you to turn off your phones and he will guide you inside the third and last space, which is also a perfect five by five by five meter cube space, which is right there in the middle. He also explains that if there is an emergency, if there is a panic, there is a panic button for you to get out because the door will be closed for those three minutes. So once you are inside, you are in the dark, in complete darkness. Here I had to, to do some tricks in order to photograph this because you cannot see, basically. So you're in the darkness for 60 seconds. And as your eyes are getting used to the darkness, slowly some silhouettes emerge in the background. What you see there, but you're in the dark. And after 60 seconds of full darkness, the lights start. And the lights will go from 10% to 100% in 90 seconds. And as the lights start increasing and increasing, then you realize that the two side walls are mirrors. And so the space becomes larger and larger as the light grows. And so the back wall is, about, is a wall with silhouettes of faces. These of faces of people who died during the Pinochet regime, killed by Pinochet and his troops. But the other half are also people who is alive today. So they are mixed, both people that died and people that is alive today, anonymous Chileans. Those who died can be perfectly recognized by their relatives. We scan the images, uh, the frontal portraits, and just made the outline without the faces. And of course, when you discover the mirror, the front wall is projected with yourself to infinity to on both sides. Here, I didn't want to isolate the victims in a crypt, in a space, like most memorials do. I wanted to integrate them into a, a collective narrative with the present, with people that is alive. And so I wanted you to be illuminated by their faces, the faces of both living and dead people. And so it's a memorial not only for the victims, but for all of us, for the 17 million Chileans. That is why this multiplication of faces. After 90 seconds, where you have been practically blinded with the lights, then it goes completely dark again for 30 seconds. And this time, the lights remained in your brain, 
you print it, you have an effect called the after-image effect, and where you'll see millions of points of light. So it's a way for you to take these faces with you. At that moment, the doors open automatically. It's all controlled by a computer, and then you just leave the space. You go through the lobby again and leave. This is called the Geometry of Conscience, and it just opened in Santiago de Chile. It's a permanent memorial. If you're searching for hell, look for the artist. If you can't find the artist, you're already in hell. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alfredo, for those really arresting images. They're nothing, and your explication of them, rather, is nothing short of astounding. I'd like to introduce now Manthia Diawara. Manthia Diawara is a professor of comparative literature and director of the Africana Studies Program and director of the Institute of Afro-American Affairs at New York University. A native of Mali, Professor Diawara received his education in France and his PhD from Indiana University. He has taught at the University of California at Santa Barbara and the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of We Won't Budge, An African Exile in the World, Black American Cinema, Aesthetics and Spectatorship, African Cinema, Politics and Culture, and In Search of Africa. His most recent book is African Film, New Forms of Aesthetics and Politics from Prestel. Diawara's own work as a filmmaker, has document, he has documented cultural giants of our time, and his African Cities project has presented a view of a modern and postmodern Africa that is rarely seen in mass media. His film credits also include Diaspora Conversation, In Search of Africa, and the German-produced documentary, Rausch in Reverse. Diorawa's most recent documentary film is Who's Afraid of Nguni, about Nguni Wat Thiongo and his return to Kenya after years of exile. He is the editor-in-chief of Black Renaissance, Renaissance Noir, a journal of arts, culture, and politics. Recently, he has also consulted to the Musée de Quai Branly in Paris to create ways of including African voices and perspectives in their exhibitions. And I should that say that when I invited um, Professor Diawara to speak with Alfredo Yar. I had no idea that they had a long friendship and had spent time in Martinique, and there was a natural affinity between the two. Um, and I'm so pleased that we get to listen in on all the good things that they have to say to each other. Can you hear me? Yes. yes? Okay. Hello? Okay, good. All right, I guess I should go now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please. 
I want to also begin by thanking her with a very loud or deep voice, I guess. Uh, let me put this down a little bit. It's going to help. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jessica Martinez for inviting me in the Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian. Um, really happy to be here with Alfredo because uh, I've known him forever, admired his work, and he brings up uh, very interesting questions, but also challenging ways of looking at art. Uh, just, I've taken some notes, went through his work, but just watching uh, the presentation tonight, uh, one of the first things that came to my mind that, that I found very challenging is the following. Uh, the ways in which your art, I think you mentioned yourself, the word essay. Uh, your art kind of pushes the boundaries of art. Uh, and the best word you use again is uh, public space. Uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, public intellectual, when the artist becomes public intellectual. And this, in some ways, has two implications for me. Uh, one implication is that you have to break the genre. Let's say uh, many artists today, African writers especially, or African filmmakers, begin to speak for Africa. They begin to, they become public intellectuals. They write essays in newspapers. They explain Africa. When they are writers, instead of just writing novels, artists. So it's a condition that we are in where uh, I think Alfredo's uh, work uh, explained to us there is this silence and indifference, desensitization, uh, distanciation, I don't know, there are many academic words. Uh, silence around uh, Rwanda. So the artist suddenly has to be more than the artist to talk about it. I found that very interesting uh, in your work. And I don't even know if one can help but to do that. I mean, it would be interesting just to be an architect. It'd be interesting just to do some work of art and to see the formal relation between architecture and art and so on. Uh, but you have to become a public intellectual. Uh, that pushing of genre, of form, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, it's the Pasolini model. Pasolini is someone I deeply admire and um, I actually created just very recently a film on him called The Ashes of Pasolini. And um, Pasolini was a filmmaker, but he was also a writer, a poet, a critic, a journalist, someone that was deeply involved with the cultural life, but also the political life of his country. And so it is this tradition of the uh, public intellectual that doesn't exist much in this country. We never hear intellectual speaking. Or the media doesn't let them speak publicly. When I, want to, when I wanted to read uh, Susan Sontag, for example, I had to read it in The Guardian or in Le Monde, in Liberation, in Europe. She would have essays and columns, but she would never be published here in the daily papers. And today, it's the same happening with Noam Chomsky, for example. So I'm interested in that kind of intellectual. And, and of course, the African model is that one of the person that is active within the cultural life of the country, but also in the political life, and trying to, to affect change both from the cultural world and into the political world. And so it's a model I've always followed. And perhaps it has to do with the fact that I never studied art. So I don't know what art is. I really don't know. I'm an architect. I studied architecture. And, um, and I have no preconceptions of any kind about what art is or should be. So I feel very free. And so I'm, I'm, I reinvent the language of art every day. That's what I try to do. I invent things. Sometimes it works, most of the time it doesn't. But it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't mind, I don't mind. It's really for me 
that's why I call them exercises. They are exercises where I learn, I learn in a very public way, in a way, but I learn and I move on. Uh, tonight I was really interested in this question because it's not one of the questions I brought with me, but there is a way in which it pushes the boundary of form, and I was quite taken by that, uh, particularly uh, you, s you show uh, cover, uh, covers of Newsweek, of Time, of New York Times, and, and so on. And in the background, you force the audience to think about Rwanda. Uh, and then you came back and you said, uh, I want you to go in the dark. I want you to look for something in order to see it. You know, because uh, earlier I was being uh, interviewed by a young lady about Africa. If we are complaining about the way Africa is represented in the media, what is the, how do we represent Africa, therefore? How do you do it? What is the way of looking for the truth? And I think one of the ways is the way you went in the dark in your show and make people look for something and get closer and closer and closer. So I was quite interested in that. The idea that you take time, there is silence, uh, you search, you work at it, uh, you stop uh, all this uh, commodification, consumption, and then finally begin to see things. You resist a little bit. I thought that was quite interesting in the work. Yeah. Well, um, perhaps it has to do with the fact that I, I believe that art is communication. That is, for me, fundamental. And uh, when you look at the technical definition of communication, communication is not to throw a message. This has nothing to do with communication. Communication requires an answer. If there is no answer, there is no communication, and there is no art. So what I do, I, I, I build environments and devices and opportunities and strategies of communication. And as an architect who designed these works, I give myself a program where I'm trying to communicate with different publics at the same time. And so I'm trying to offer different points of entry at the same time. And my objective is to, communi to communicate and to get an answer. And so perhaps that's why um, I use these strategies. But again, these are just exercises. Mm. And, and most of them have failed. But I've learned so much from them. And I keep trying new strategies of communication. No, I, I mean, I, I learned a lot uh, from it. That's why I brought up the question. One of the questions, the points that I wanted to bring up with you uh, in coming here, uh, prepared this time, uh, had to do with Africa. Now, your work in many ways could be categorized as humanitarian, as left, as a, as a work that plays on our conscience in the West in many ways. But you never challenge Africans. I mean, they have a responsibility in this. Uh, they need to own some of this and at that point become accountable for it. Uh, well, I just stopped there. What do you think about it? Well, I, I, I leave you to challenge Africans. I, I will challenge the non-Africans. Uh, the last concert that I attended of Fela, which was one of my heroes, I went to the shrine uh, in Lagos, Nigeria, many times just to see Fela because I, I really was, I was a fan. And um, he, he, the last concert I saw of him, he, he looked at the audience and he said, you Africans, listen to me as Africans. And you non-Africans, and he looked at me, because I was probably the only white guy in the back there. He said, listen to me with an open mind. And so uh, I really, it's a fantastic question. I've never been asked that question. And I think 
is because I'm afraid of not being, uh, that, is, that I'm not doing something that is legitimate as a non-African to, to criticize Africans. So what I do, I criticize non-Africans because I'm a non-African and I feel pretty safe and I do it all the time and I get into problems, but it's, it's, it's let's say, my larger community. But I, 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 I know that Africans, in, in some cases, have some responsibility, but I've never dared to do that. And I don't know if I will ever will. But it's, a, it's an interesting thing that, I've, that you asked me because, of course, it's, I mean, when I'm doing research, I realize certain things would be different. And of course, it's not always 100%, you know, the, the, the guilt or the fault of the West, the so-called West or, or the, the former colonial master. It's much more complicated than that. But I don't think I, um, I've never dared to do that. But, but, but as I told you when, I, when we met in the train, that I would like this to be a real dialogue because this is also someone that you should listen to. So how do you do it? How, 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 how can it be, I mean, advise me first and then tell us how do you do it? No, no, <laughs> well, you seen this, huh? I think uh, it's a great strategy. Let me see. Uh, in many ways, I, I guess the biggest challenge for me is, is the following. You showed uh, three or four shots. Uh, should we recolonize Africa? Or you see Africa, but it's the image of the lion with teeth red with blood, uh, you know, cannibalism connotation and so on. Uh, but you can also go into literature, you know, uh, Stephen Smith's, uh, uh, I think it's called uh, Afro, Africa Philia, no, no. A title like that, but a very racist uh, book published in France recently. Uh, but you could also look at the everyday life, the images that you were showing from uh, in a way. Uh, how do you criticize Africa without actually repeating this? You know, not, not long ago, Africa, uh, a few African Americans tried to talk about Africa, the Richburg, for example. Uh, I don't know if you remember his book, a, a former Washington Post uh, writer. Uh, and both Africans and African Americans were revolted. How can an African or a black person talk this way about Africa? But how do we look at contradictions in a very calm, confident, serious way you are looking at contradictions and try to see if we can resolve them or go beyond them. Uh, let me look at contradictions. Why is it that if you look at Africa today, we have the World Cup organized in South Africa. We have the, uh, the Rugby Cup. We have Mandela. And then African countries that fought for independence well, South Africa was the, the home of apartheid. But African countries that fought for independence, like Rwanda, here they are killing each other. Uh, they have gone back to tribalism, where South Africa is a symbol of democracy. I think we need to question this. I think we need to question uh, why Bernard Bongo's son replaces him. Uh, Ayadema's son replaces him. Bagbo is in power, has hijacked Ivory Coast, one of the most developed African countries, for five years. We can't have an election unless I'm sure that I'm going to win. So if I can win, then no election. Why is Wad threatening to run again with his son? I think we, we can talk about these things. I think we can talk about the nation state, ironically, uh, I think the Caribbean poet, Edouard Glissant, has the best way of talking about this. Uh, the, the two countries that invented democracy in uh, uh, England and France, most democratic countries 
who are colon colonized, biggest colonizers of Africa. But ironically, they forced Africans to look for their independence through democracy. How democracy is used in these different ways. So Africans had to fight for democracy to, in order to become independent. But Africans were colonized by democratic countries. So, I mean, you talk about France today yourself. When you begin to look at this, it, then Africans get in a position to own their own history and therefore to be responsible for crimes uh, and, and to pay for these crimes. And I think if we do that, we get past the aid always helping Africa. We get past corruption because some of the aid, you know, whether we're talking about Darfur or many of these refugee places, camps, in my opinion, as long as we're aiding from, uh, I don't know, Bill Gates to whomever, then we're also breeding corruption because these are structures, infrastructures that also help to develop corruption in Africa. I think the only way we get out of this is really to make Africans own Africa. And nobody is raising this question. You know, Africans are not because it's not in their interest. You know, if I go back to Mali today, I become a big chief, I marry four wives, and uh, I'm fine. And people who are stealing the coltan, they're fine also. They sell the coltan, they sell the diamonds, they sell the oil. So corruption breeds corruption, but the images only say that Africans are corrupt. You know, so. I think Africans and non-Africans should be able to talk about these things uh, without being racist. I agree, but it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult because when you, uh, we have limited tools to represent things. And so one of the, uh, the key dilemmas that we face as artists, as people who represent things, is that when we want to represent racism, we want to attack racism, how do we do that without actually repeating the same racist structures in order to demonstrate that yes. it is wrong? Absolutely. So it is very difficult yeah. to do. Yeah. And, um, and so it, that's why it ended up being easier to do it you know, within my own community and, and attacking Newsweek instead of attacking you know, the same Rwandans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really, really very complicated. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to dwell too long on this subject, but we have to also remember what's happening in the Congo today. You know, you go, first it was Rwanda and now it's in Congo, and the UN is afraid to bring out the report. But I, I, I want to go back to your work because I think, I think it's, it really brings up questions and uh, points that are essential to me. Uh, you, you said somewhere, he said, you have to get out of yourself and get into someone else. I like that a lot. I like that a lot because in many ways, one of the problems that we see uh, with the Newsweek uh, covers, uh, Le Monde, uh, New York Times, is that people cannot imagine that a white person can, can get out of him herself and get into a black person, and a black person can get out of himself and get into a white person. And again, as Edward Gleason will say, would I destroying yourself? Because we think that we are afraid of the other person because we think that if we get into the other person, we get to know the other person, we exchange with the other person, it will destroy our authenticity, it will dilute us, it will uh, uh, make us unreal. But actually, you can learn from the other person and still stay yourself. Uh, Gleason's way of saying it, you know this, it's a big Gleason statement. It, it is, je peux changer en m'échangeant avec l'autre sans me détruire ni me dénaturer. So I can change by exchanging with the other without destroying myself or uh, denaturing myself. I mean, that's what I was hearing. I mean, can you talk a little more about that? 
Wow. Um, well. Oh, let me let me add this actually, because I'm coming from literature, and for the last 15 years we've studied what we call the other, spelled with capital O, and the way we we describe the other, is always something that cannot be reconciled with ourselves. It's in opposition. It's like Hegelian. It's like the the same and the other. And what Gleason is trying to say is that actually it's just difference. And when you look at difference, there is difference everywhere. There are small differences. There are big differences. It's not a problem of black and white. It's a problem of difference which exists among all of us. And I think when you say get out of yourself, get into the other, that's, I was seeing difference in that sense, but not in this post-colonial study where the other is something you can never touch, because the other is something authentic that is going to always elude you. Well, it has to do with the fact that I always felt that it, I feel very privileged to be an artist, an extraordinary privilege, because uh, society has given me the time and the means to think, because that's what we do. We, we're all the time thinking. I'm not making things. I'm not creating things. I'm thinking. Uh, artists and intellectuals are thinking people. That's what we, th we do. It's 90% of the process is thinking. And it's only maybe 10% where you actually produce things. And that's an extraordinary privilege. But that privilege comes with a responsibility. And in, in, in my case, responsibility towards my community and towards where I live and towards the world in general, towards humanity. And so it's impossible for me to ignore the realities of the, wo the world surrounding me. And the fact that I do what I do is because when I moved to New York in the 80s, uh, the art world was incredibly uh, self-referential. Yeah. But incredibly self-referential. There was nothing about the outside world in that art world, but nothing. And an international exhibition at the time meant a few Americans and a few Germans. That was international. Yeah. <laughs> the world did not exist. Mm -hmm. And so that was shocking to me. And I thought, well, I'm going to bring the news of the world to this world. And so I went away, and I started my first major project, which was the miners of Brazil in Serra Pelada. And I started doing this kind of work where I wanted to bring the outside world to this world and to tell them, you know, it's, it's just one big world. I, when I was in Rwanda, after a month of horror, I escaped with my assistant, and we went to Kampala, Uganda, for three days. We needed to take a shower. We needed to eat. And so we checked in in a hotel. We took the longest shower ever, and then we dropped on the beds and watched TV. And they had CNN, and they had the news. World News International, CNN. And so we were there watching. And World News International was O.J. Simpson, okay? And that was the world news, the entire program. That is how far is the world goes. And so I was born in Chile. I lived in Martinique for 10 years. I, 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 I grew up in an island where the word uh, um, negritude was, was born invented by a great writer called Emile Césaire. This is, I went to a school called Lycée Chalcher where Césaire and, 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 and Glisson and Fanon went to school and were professors. And, uh, and then I moved back to Chile and then I moved to the States and so on. And so I have traveled the world and, and I want to connect these parts that seem to be disconnected, but everything is connected. You talk about you mentioned the Congo. You mentioned the call time. Mm. Every single phone that you have here is connected to the Congo. If you knew what's happening in the Congo today because of the phone you're using, you would just drop your phone. You would never use your phone. Everything is connected. We are not disconnected anymore. Yes. We are all in one world and everything is connected. 
you mentioned the World Cup. It made me happy. The World Cup in, in South Africa, not because I like soccer, because I like soccer also. Mm -hmm. And I followed the, the games, but it was extraordinary the way, for the first time in the history of humankind, we gave a different image of Africa. Suddenly, for a month, people could see that there were stadiums. There were lights. People were playing football. And people were going at night. There were restaurants, food, cars, electricity, internet. And that was a month. In the, so I was so happy looking at this stuff. The way it changed the image of Africa for most of the world. And so we need 10 World Cups a year, for 10 years, to change the image of Africa. You... No, but let's talk about your last film, please. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you, you tell us about Glissant, for example, the last film I saw. And uh, what was your intention? Because Glissant is, is one of the most extraordinary writers living today. And, um, and I saw this most extraordinary film uh, by Mantia. And it's very difficult to do a, a great film about a great man. Because how do you translate literature into film? So that was a challenge that, you know, that's a technical challenge, but it's an intellectual challenge. So how do you represent greatness in literature in a film? Yeah. Well, I mean, first, I don't know if you know Edouard Glissant. He's a Martinique and French writer who was a classmate of uh, Franz Fanon. They grew up together. Fran uh, Fanon went to Algeria, renounced his French citizenship. Uh, Glissant was in Paris, could not go to back to Martinique because he was considered uh, subversive. But Glissant also is famous for trying to create a literary space uh, after the negative movement. So this is like the younger generation, you know, Fanon to an extent also, they all wanted to kill negative, but for different reasons. And I grew up with the thinking of neg negritude. I mean, if you grow up in Mali, Senegal, then you know Senghor, you know Césaire, and your worldview is one of resistance, one of uh, refusal, uh, one of assertion of your blackness. This is what informed us when we were growing up. Uh, in Bamako, you have to know how to recite uh, Césaire's Caïd uh, Retour uh, au Pays Natal. So, Having grown up like that, you come to the West as a black man and you teach the world your blackness. Then you encounter Edouard Glissant. Uh, Edouard Glissant, he, he, first he was surprising me when he made this statement about I can change by exchanging with the other without destroying myself. Because my philosophy was, stay your authentic self. Why do you want to exchange with the other? So he was quite surprising then. And then he started talking about Columbus. And he said, it's Columbus who left. This is uh, Christopher Columbus. You know, he left, but it's, it's I who returned. Meaning that Columbus left his native uh, world with the slave mentality taking slaves or uh, at least bleeding in this mentality of uh, black and white. And Glissant returns, and Glissant is a, sy a symbol of black people in this sense, uh, African American, black people especially in the diaspora, Brazil, United States, Caribbean, and so on, who went through slavery, then gained freedom, but not only gained freedom, but teach the world the meaning of freedom through jazz, through all the things that are universal. Suddenly they're freer than Columbus. And I was surprised by that too. So, you know, without being Gleason's student, I said, I better make a film on this person in order to understand him better. Now, it was very difficult to make the film because most, uh, his, 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 his thought is very complex. 
it's really, and I didn't want to make a film about somebody who, you know, and tell you he was born in Martinique and he was raised here, he went to this school. I didn't want to do that, a biography. So what I did, I took a boat with him from uh, Southampton in U UK to New York. And then that way he will talk about the Atlantic crossing, you know, the slaves crossing the Atlantic and what that meant and how to philosoph philosophize that. Uh, and how he talks about that in terms of freedom as opposed to, to slavery, pain, uh, it, it was just illuminating to me. So what I ended up doing, I didn't want to do like my other films and trying to get the thesis and the thesis. So I just did like a typewriter and then you see Gleason coming and he talks about a concept. The concept will be creolization, which is one of the concepts he really developed. Or the concept will be uh, poetic de la relation. Or the concept will be opacité. Gleason, by the way, he is known for, he said, you don't need to understand the other to love the, the other person. You know, you can love somebody without understanding them. Why the rational people always want to control things, maintain them and hold them in one place. So I wanted to make a film about a man like that, but to, in my American way, because I'm very Americanized also, uh, Americans like to understand things. So I said to Gleason, I said, pretend that I'm 12 year old and you are explaining all these ideas to me. So, you know, that's what the film is about, basically. He's trying to explain all these complex ideas, but in a very simple language. Uh, yes, that's what the film is about. Do you want us to open? Yeah. Open to mic is open there for questions. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, this question is addressed to Mr. Jar. I'm just curious about how you came upon Rwanda and why you went so deep into it. How do I come up upon Rwanda? Yes. And how, why I was so deep? into it. I was asking Mr. Ja. That's right. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Scared. We have the Ja, yes. you know, so. <laughs> um, I, as an artist, I spent the first hour or two in my studio looking at the news of the world. Uh, before the internet, I used to subscribe to many newspapers and magazines and uh, now with the internet, it has become much easier. But uh, I'm, I'm very much interested how news events are reported from different points of views, with different ideological agendas. This fascinates me, and I've done a lot of works showing how this event can be looked from here and from here, and how it affects our understanding of the world and those events. So in, in 1994, when uh, the genocide started, I was shocked to see that no one was reacting. No one. And uh, it kept going, it kept going, and I, and I realized hundreds of thousands of people were dying, and there was nothing, nothing. I just could not believe it, that we were allowing this to happen, and no one was reacting. And uh, the United States and France, mostly those two, we're asking journalists never to use the word genocide because, you know, if the word genocide was used officially, then because these countries have signed the Charter of the United Nations, they had to intervene. Mm. So it was very important never to speak about genocide. No, it was just a tribal war. You know, it's not nothing important. And so I think I, I reached a limit where I couldn't stay away and I had to go see for myself, express solidarity, witness, and do something. It was insane, it was crazy, I almost died many times. But I had to do it because I, I couldn't be away from this, just watching like everyone else and, and not acting. But I was ashamed of being a human being at the time. I really expected 
people in the streets marching every day asking their governments to stop these killings. But the, this country was memorized, mesmerized with uh, O.J. Simpson. And the media was just giving it and giving it and giving it. And so I went and uh, I accumulated this horrific material. And of course, when I came back, I didn't know what to do with it. What do you do with it? If nobody cared, so why? And so that's how I decided to develop a new set of strategies. So that's why these kind of works that are also different from each other. And each one uses a different strategy of representation. And uh, uh, I learned, I learned enormously. And from each new work, I, I, I moved on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And, um, but I still think I don't know anything. I'm doing this memorial, I still, I have a lot of, I ask myself a lot of questions. Am, am I right? Am I doing things right? So when I submitted my design, I requested uh, the assistance of the seven major uh, organizations of survivors in one. And I wanted them to look at this proposal and vote on it. And I wanted to have the okay from all seven because I, have all, I always have these doubts, you know, what the hell am I doing there? And the answer to that question is, is that I'm really interested in, our, in how we look at this. I'm never speaking for anybody but for myself. I'm never pretending to be a Rwandan or speak for Rwandans. I speak for myself and for my community and my society. But that's how I ended up being going to Rwanda. And as I said, I started and, and I could never stop. I couldn't stop because the works were failing and failing and failing. And I thought, well, I have to keep going, develop new strategies. Only when I, I, I went through the, the, the Gutete Medita piece, then I felt that maybe I, I discovered something and I, I developed works in, in that direction. Good evening. Uh, Professor Diwar, you mentioned the UN report that recently came out, and I'd like to just return to that for a moment and ask both of you to respond to this. Um, the report, of course, uh, tells us that uh, as Hutu left the borders of Rwanda, they were followed by Tutsi, and that violence was propagated in northeastern Congo as a result. Now, of course, the, the, the report has been tabled at the request of the Rwandan government, so my, my question to you is that what, why do you think that the Rwandan government today is able to control this narrative when the atrocities in this region of the world persist right now um, and the events that you presented happened in 1994? Why does Rwanda continue to have a grip on the questions that can be asked and thus the answers? And does it deal with more than the world's guilt at a lack of response? Is there more to it than that? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's a very complex issue. Uh, it's complex in a way, first, that the, the way African nations uh, or the world nations have a, a form of uh, sovereignty, uh, a form of uh, control on the borders in many ways, uh, but also after the genocide, there was and this is legitimate. After, uh, there was a, a, a move on the part of Kagame and the Rwandan government to create, I wrote an essay about this, to create an, a, a state of excep exceptionalism, exceptionality in Africa, to basically get a uh, take on the Israeli model of never again, uh, to get all the elements of uh, borrowed from Israel, Holocaust, uh, genocide, uh, which are all true, by the way, so that there is no denial of this. But by controlling these key terms, and by also making Rwanda the friend of the West, particularly the US and many other countries, I think they were able, on the one hand, to rehabilitate people in Rwanda, but on the other hand, 
at the expense of Congolese. Uh, it, it, Rwanda has a role clearly in the, in the catastrophe, in all the problems that took place in the Congo and are taking place in the Congo today. Uh, so, but at the same time, Rwanda has trained itself to become a model country, democratic country. Again, I go back to the irony of democracy that I was talking about earlier. And therefore, to be the leader in the peacekeeping in Darfur in many other places. Uh, it, it, and to be a leader also in development, because every little, every inch of something in Africa is considered progress. So things are working in Uganda in a way that they're not working in Mali or other places. So the West really uh, does not want to play, they don't, they don't want to push Kagame against the wall. This is my complete subjective reading. But I have been suspicious of this since around 2000, that it can be possible that I visited uh, Uganda, and uh, Rwandans at that time were working with uh, Ugandans and other neighboring countries to control the Congo because of the diamonds, because of the gold, because of the coltan. And Rwanda had an influence in Uganda. It was clear at that time. Uh, you visit all the neighboring countries, militaristically they were very well trained. So I don't, I don't know. I think just as in 1994, people were afraid of using the word genocide People are afraid of using the word genocide today. And what's going to happen uh, if we don't use the word geno genocide? Because some people are saying three million people died in the Congo. You know, they're putting all kind of numbers on it. Uh, how are we going to deal with that? And I, you know, I, it's a complex question. I really don't, I have my own subjectivity. Uh, but I don't think I really know all the reasons. I honestly don't. Uh, the, this becomes even more complicated if you make another reading and think about the issue of language. It's, it's a very long story, but to make it very short, uh, the Tutsis left uh, Rwanda as refugees speaking French because Rwanda is a former Belgian colony. Yeah. And they came back speaking English because they, they found refuge mostly in Uganda which is a former British colony. And so, uh, in a way, you can read it through the, the language lens that when they came back, they came back speaking English, and, uh, and so it's the, it's the they, they had the backing of the United States and all the Anglophone countries. And France has seen its share going backwards because they're losing uh, uh, terrain with the French. And so there is also this issue now, this antagonism in this very little country of two languages. And now the Rwandans have decided to use English, and English has become the official language to that point. Because they accuse the French of being participants of the yes. genocide. Yeah. And so now, unfortunately, everything that happens around Rwanda has to do, has to be also seen and looked through that lens of this antagonism of these two countries, the French and the, and the US, the US supporting uh, or, or attacking Rwanda on, on all levels. And so it's, it makes things even more complicated. Hi, good evening. First of all, I wanted to say this has been a really important conversation and, and I'm so glad that, that um, you're here to have it. And I also wanted to uh, say how happy I was that, um, Alfredo uh, Jar, that you've uh, avoided the sort of pornography and brought to, to the attention the uh, sort of pornography of disaster and, and pornography of, of violence that characterized a lot of the things that you showed. Um, but what, what I'm, my question has to do with the question that was asked to me actually um, in Asia just 
a few days ago. Um, I was in Korea and um, people were talking about, two people brought up the uh, Africa and they said, you know, what is it with the African continent? Why haven't we seen the kind of development that we see um, in Asia? They said, we were colonized in Korea by the Japanese and, you know, we came together and now we're a top power. Um, they said, you know, in Asia, uh, dictators make the people suffer, but for a result for the whole country. And in Africa, people suffer, um, dictators make people suffer to enrich themselves. Whether that's actually true or not, and to some extent I think it is, some extent uh, it's, it's not, um, it's been bedeviling me for since, and um, I want to know what you would answer. Thanks. Um, well, first of all, most of these countries are very young. Uh, my most recent project in Africa is taking place in Angola, and Angola became independent in 1975. So this is really. I mean, you don't make a country in 35 years. But uh, beyond that, uh, it's something that we were discussing earlier uh, together, is the fact that when, when all these countries became independent, they became independent officially. You know, from a juridical point of view, from the UN point of view, et cetera, et cetera, they became sovereign states. But all the structures, that, that were left there once the colonial masters left, they are still there in most of these countries. So they didn't start from scratch. Now we are free, now we are in a democracy, and we're got, we, we are all equal, and we're gonna start this ideal world. It's not like this. So a lot of these structures that were created by these colonial masters were still in place. And, uh, and so what we are seeing is not uh, what we think we are seeing. What we are seeing is just uh, uh, maybe a continuation of a certain kind of colonialism that still exists within these countries. So the, what's happening, you have to see through that lens, not just through this ideal lens that everything is fine and nothing has happened, no. The, so, we, it will take time and, and new generations to make th things really change from structurally from inside. That's, that would be one possible answer. But I'm sure you have your... Uh, for me, I mean, the, the Korean example or the, the Japanese example, I mean, it, it's, it's a good example, but it brings up, uh, and many Africans have raised uh, that that example as well, the Congolese writer who just passed uh, away, Bolia, wrote a book called L'African Kimono, you know, what can Africans, you know, African samurais and so on, uh, things like that. But the point is that this brings up something that's related to what Fredo just, just said. Uh, the youth, the, the, the how African independence is, you know, this 50 years, 30 years in some cases. Uh, but it also brings up not only neocolonialism, but uh, the West lack of serious investment in Africa. And this goes all the way to Barack Obama. You compare Barack's speech in all other places and the speech in Ghana. All you have to do is do that. In Ghana, he wanted to maintain the status quo. Make sure things don't get out of control. Uh, make sure you bring more democracy. But there is no serious way on the part of the West. I'm a Westerner myself. Uh, there is no serious way to really engage Africa, to accept that Africans own Africa. The resources of Brazil, you talk about the gold mines and so on, they are exploited, but we know they belong to Brazilians, 
capitalists come and do things. But in Africa, people don't ever raise these questions. You just go and take things out, including myself. I take things out. Mm -hmm. Nobody sit to question this fact that African things belong to Africans. And then there is no Marshall Plan in Africa the way we've had it in the other places. We just, including myself again, celebrate the informal economy in Africa. That's not going to develop the country. We need some infrastructures. We don't have them. We need to start, again, aiding Africa because the aid infrastructure, no matter how well-intentioned it is, breeds corruption. You know, so you have all these elements. And then I really think that Africans have to stand up themselves. Nobody is going to do it for Africans. They have to stand up and do it. And so far, the way we have been doing it is either through the nation state or through the tribe. Neither one works. Let's say if I'm the president of Mali, only the culture of my, my tribe is Malian culture. All the other cultures don't count. If I'm the president of Nigeria, the Yoruba tribe would be the only Nigerian culture. So it's not working. And the nation state also just is not viable. We did the nation state in Africa in order to go to Pan-Africanism. But once we become independent country by country, suddenly we brought up the idea of sovereignty. And nobody has the right to interfere with the other country. So and until young generations such as yourself begin to question, bring up those kind of questions, you know, I will continue to exploit you. So that's what I would say to that. First of all, thank you so much for an incredibly moving and stimulating evening. Um, this question is for Mr. Yar. Um, you have rather tantalizingly mentioned uh, the failure of your work on a number of occasions this evening. And I'm very curious about that. Uh, and what, what, how do you see the initial stages of this work, or the initial projects, as a failure, what, what is your metric for success or failure in this work? And because as you present this, this body of work this evening, uh, the message is so clear. And, and is it that sort of that the early work that you deemed a failure uh, was, was simply part of, part of what was uh, a process or a growth in this work and, and such that you can only see it as a success uh, when it's taken as a whole. Thank you. Um, I speak of failure because we failed as, as a society to stop the genocide, to stop the killings. So a million people died in 100 days, and nobody did nothing. I think we failed as a human group. And so that is the biggest failure. And so in a way, Whatever we do after that is just a reflection of that faith. So that we didn't stop it. So the work is born out of that realization, and, so, and it cannot do anything about it. So you start with a basic failure. So that's why I, I have this tendency to speak about faith. So the larger context is that we failed, so nothing we can do can, can fix things. So it's a failure. Now, as an architect, I design each work and I give myself an objective. And so I would have to go project by project and, and, and identify for you, OK, what was my objective in this particular project? And did I accomplish something or did I fail again? So I would say that in if we look at the individual projects, in some of them were more successful than others. And I don't think we, we have the time to, to go in depth which ones were and why. But basically, um, I gave myself a program and I said, OK, with this project now, I want to do this. And let's see if I succeed doing this. Something very specific to that project. And so as I said, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. 
But most of the time, I, I didn't care so much about those particular uh, objectives of each project because I was more under this heavy umbrella of this huge failure of, of humankind towards Rwanda. And uh, now as an artist in, in these projects and other projects, um, I measure failure in, or, or success in different ways. Some artists measure success if they sell the work. Others feel successful if they get a review in, in, in the Times so or in Art Forum. That's the sex, success, success, success. And uh, other people measure success, you know, by the audience, how many people came to see my show. Others want to hear the opinion of, you know, these three people. I want to know what you thought. If that person thought highly of that work, then I'm successful. So each one invents, creates their own measurements, how you measure your own success. For me, because I'm an architect, I design these and I give myself an objective, a precise objective. So I measure success only based on if I have accomplished the objective of that particular point. We have time for one final question. I feel terribly guilty. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, briefly your, uh, the, this tension between information and spectacle in the work that you do. And for those of us who are from Africa or are concerned about Africa, all of us are you know, deadened by this image of Africa as a place uh, for disease and um, um, failure and drought and everything bad coming out of Africa. So I guess my question is, um, at the points when you had to breathe and you had to photograph the field and the road and, and the cloud, um, did you feel a sense of betrayal for doing that, given the circumstances and the topic, mat you know, the, the matter that you were dealing with, was taking time away from those images? How did you deal with that? No, I didn't feel giddy at all because I didn't even realize I was doing it. At the time, I, I, I shot flowers and, and landscapes and beautiful things, and I, I wasn't aware. But when you came back to exhibit when I, it? When I, when I came back and I brought uh, hundreds of rolls of films, this was not the digital times, it was the time of rolls, and I would give them to the lab, you know, just a few at a time, just in case something happened, and the images were starting to come back. The first time I saw a lot of flowers, I thought the lab had made a mistake. I thought, this is not mine. So I called the lab and I said, hey, you gave me a film that's not mine. So I, I read them the number and, and they checked their, their information and said, no, it's yours. I said, no, it's not me. And then when they insisted, I went back, and of course the flowers were in between other things. And it started happening and happening and happening. So I had to ask my, my psychiatrist. <laughs> because of course I, I, I needed help at the time because of what I had seen. Um, and he told me, it's, it's very simple. You were looking for breathing spaces. You needed to breathe. You cannot you know, be looking through these... Uh, this lens and, and how many corpses can you see? Mm -hmm. you know, how much pain can you take? So I was looking for breathing spaces and um, that's how I did it. And so that piece, uh, Field, Wall and Cloud, that I showed um, was you know, a reflection on, on these images. Why did I take these images? How can I communicate the horror through these images? Did you exhibit those alongside the other images or were they separate? Well, Display? that was a particular work, and for example, the first time I showed that work, I showed it as a, as, as, as a first piece that you see, and then you moved into the next piece where you had the eyes of Butete Merita. So I combined, for example, those two works together. Because I met Butete in the church that is actually drawn on one of the drawings from the um, Fieldwood and Cloud piece, so they were connected in a way. Thank you so much.
Well, I'd like to thank you both, Alfredo Yar and Manthi Diwara, for this robust conversation. And I invite all of you here and those of you who are watching online uh, to continue this discussion by following the National Museum of African Arts Twitter feed and our Facebook page. Um, once again, this program received federal support from the Latino Initiatives Pool administered by the Smithsonian Latino Center, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you.